All right, good morning. Uh, I'll start with uh, a little uh, tale from Hinduism. Uh, God has many names, said the guru to a disciple. And he said, and if you remember this, then no matter where you go, you will always be safe. So the disciple traveled and traveled, and everywhere he went, he said the name Ram, Ram, uh, which was uh, one of these names of God. And so one day he came to a village, and the village was being terrorized by a wild elephant. And uh, the, the, the elephant would run through the village on a rampage, just causing all kinds of destruction. And so all the villagers warned him. They said, be careful, be careful. Don't go out in the street because there's a wild elephant. He's on a rampage. He's causing all kinds of trouble. And the disciple thought, well, my guru told me that if I, keep if I only recognize God, uh, then, uh, then I'll always be safe. And so he thinks, okay, the elephant is God. I am God. Why should I be afraid? And so he walks out into the main street of the village and just stands there. And out comes the elephant, and the elephant sees him, and they kind of have a little face off, and the elephant charges toward him, grabs him, and tosses him to the side, and really hurts the guy. Uh, so after a long, long convalescence, the disciple, the disciple returns to his guru and tells him the story, complaining. He says, you know, you told me that, that God is everything and that I would be safe. And now look at me. And the guru looked at him and says, yes, well, you know, my disciple, he said, uh, you were right to see God in yourself and also to see God in the elephant. He said, but why, why did you fail to recognize God warning you in the voice of all the villagers? <laughs> right? so, so for us in the science of mind, we believe that God, that spirit, is the ultimate and absolute truth. In divine mind, in the mind of God, think about it, there are no problems. God does not have a problem. Isn't that good news? I think that's just wonderful. Okay, so if God doesn't have a problem and I'm part of God... That means that at least in potential, in my life, in my experience, in my existence, there is the potential for not having whatever my problem today may be. So we say that, you know, well, in Science of Mind, that there's only one problem, and that problem is a belief that we are separate from God in some area of life. So how do I know if I'm, if I'm believing I'm separate from God in some area of life? Well, say it's in the area of your supply and your money. If you don't have enough, you're believing you're separate from God. If it's in the area of your health, if your health is not as good as you know it could be, then to some extent you are believing you are separate from God. If your relationships are not absolutely joyful and loving, then to some extent you are believing you are separate from God. So the truth never stops being true. The truth never goes anywhere. We do. And what I mean by that is sometimes we fill our mind with the truth and we remember our connection with God and how we are all interconnected with other people. And then other times we forget and we sort of wander away from it. And I think that's where the trouble starts to creep in. Right? But remember, the truth never stops being the truth. It never goes anywhere. So how do I go somewhere when I'm separate from the truth? Well, I would say that it's really quite simple. Because of what I start to say, what I start to think, what I picture, what I believe, you know, that all of that, I can talk myself away from knowing my connection with spirit. And also remember that we live in a world where there is a race consciousness. The thinking of the world around us is always, always pressing in on us. This is why it's important that you mind your own consciousness and I mind my consciousness every day. Because if we don't, we will find that the experiences of the world around us become our experiences. We will become the statistics that we read in the newspaper. So I think that how do I decide to respond to, 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 to what's showing up in my life? Well, maybe I've been conditioned to respond negatively. You know, Maybe my upbringing somewhere along the line told me, well, some things can't be helped. Well, you know, for us to say that as students of science of mind, to say that something can be helped, cannot be helped, that feels like we're really limiting God because God is infinite potential, that there's infinite possibilities in the mind of God. So Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, this time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it, <laughs> right? So this is potentially a great time that we are in right now. This very chapter, this page of our life is great if we know what to do with it. Do we know what to do with this time? See, I don't think we want to waste it acting like we don't. And when we act like we don't know what to do with this time, we are really, really wasting it. Do we know how to deal with what's in our life right 
right now. Because I believe that each and every one of us as spiritual beings, as emanations of the Most High God, we are fully equipped right now. We have what it takes. And I hope that's what you tell yourself. I hope you are not telling yourself, oh my God, this is too much for me. How will I ever get through this? How will I manage? I'm just overwhelmed by life. That is not helpful, I want you to know. No good will come from that at all. You have what it takes, whatever you are going through. God is on your side, and God is on everyone's side. You say, but, 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 what, but what are we saying and thinking? And that's what I think we have to ask ourselves. What am I saying? What am I thinking that is keeping me from solving the problems, from healing whatever this seeming separation is? See, if I feel like I'm not much, if I feel like I'm inferior, I'm failing to see the infinite power of God that is within me right now. It's within me as love. It's within me as wisdom. It's within me as the potential for all healing. It enables me to do wonderful, wonderful things. So, you know, in our teaching in the science of mind, Ernest Holmes talks a lot and teaches a lot about our subconscious mind and that our subconscious mind will accept and will believe uh, whatever we feed it from our, our conscious mind feeds our subconscious mind. So the subconscious mind accepts our convictions and what we predominantly, predominantly think and believe. I always have to say that because people will say to me, well, you know, the other day I was on a little bit of a negative jag for a while and blah, blah. And I say, but is that the general tendency of your thinking every day? Because Ernest is very clear in our textbook. He teaches us that it's the general tendency of our thinking. So everybody goes off the rails once in a while a little bit. But if you find you're off the rails more than you're on the rails, then we really need to talk. We have some serious, serious work to do. Now, we are all expressions of infinite mind. As I like to say, we are all children of the Most High. So is our thinking and our belief with this truth that we are all the sons and daughters of God? Far too often, I think we're caught up in, oh, I can't, and I'm not enough, and I'm not good enough, and I can't handle my life. Or worse, we think that somehow, the difficulty we find ourselves in right now is God-ordained for us. You know, God wants me to suffer. I'm sorry, that is, first of all, it's just incredibly dreary. And second of all, it is not true. I do not believe that God intends for any one of God's children to suffer ever, ever, ever. So I think we are to enjoy, not endure. See, enjoying is... Um, is not abusing, uh, it, it's, it, it, you know, enjoy, it, it's, it's more of a quality of God, the joy of God. So we are enough right now. So this mother uh, dials her daughter's number. She says, hello, darling, how are you? Oh, terrible, mom. My back is killing me. The kids are acting up. The house is a mess, and I'm expecting six, six guests for dinner tonight. And the mother replies, oh, don't worry, honey. I'm coming over right now. I will feed the kids, clean up your place, and cook a dinner your guests will never forget. And she goes, oh, you are an angel, says the daughter. Oh, and by the way, Mom, how's Dad? She says, Dad, dear, you know, your, your dad died nine years ago. What number did I call? And the daughter replies, oh, oh, you must have dialed the wrong number. But wait, wait a minute. Does this mean you're not coming over? See, I think that's what, often what we're waiting for. That's, that's what we're, you know, a, a big part of our education, I think, is devoted to trying to solve problems given to us by people who, who ever along the way, as well-intentioned as they were, did not know any better. Maybe we believe that, that it's, uh, it, it's natural for problems to uh, show up. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, the path can't be all roses. Why not? If you plant enough of them, why not? You know, I think in life, they're, they're um, that God does not give us problems, uh, but problems are available if we take them. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You know, it's like I'm saying on a, and very quietly myself, ooh, this looks like trouble. I think I'll take this on. You know, I'm going to dance with this for a while. This could really set me back. This could be a wonderful distraction I use to avoid more important things in my life. So we have to say to ourselves, I can do all things through God, through spirit, through truth, through love, through the Christ within me. So mind is what is creative. Consciousness is what is creative. It's like we're saying, give me this problem, you know, because with God, I know I can handle it. So, so if, if I say it, then feel. See, this is feeling. Feeling is important in this. Ernest Holmes says that feeling is intelligently directed creation. 
So when you catch the feeling of the desired result, you know, how will I feel when my body is healed? How will I feel when, um, when I find my perfect home? How will I feel when my right and perfect job that pays me abundantly shows up? How will that feel? When you get the feeling, he says, that's intelligently directed creation. So we say it, then feel the presence, which is the presence of vitality, of peace, of intelligence, wholeness, power. See, because the more real the presence and the power is to us, the more loving we are, you know, the higher we go in consciousness, and the easier the difficulties are to solve. Because we know, ah, this is nothing. This is nothing. I can take care of this. See, healings may come slowly or quickly, but that's all according to our faith. It's all according to our belief. We look at some people and say, wow, they healed that like that. Why'd that go? They had greater faith. They had greater belief. They had less doubt. And I know sometimes we all struggle with this. We all struggle with our doubt and our fear that it's not going to work out. But a better quality of thought creates a better quality of experience for all of us. Ernest Holmes said, the law of life is a law of growth. No, but that means you did not just come here to hang out. You know, you did not just come here to hang out. That we all came here because we are on a trajectory of growth. You know, this is the, that is the greater experience of life. New experiences, ideas, beliefs, enjoyments, creations. And if my problem is someone else, I may be the only one, probably nobody here, right? You know, that somebody in my life is really uh, disrupting my peace of mind or, or they're sick or they're broke or whatever, then absolutely I must work on my own consciousness and remember that there is one mind, that we are connected. And then as I work on my consciousness, it will absolutely have an effect on them. Because the mental image we have is always, always what manifests. So I have to ask myself, do I see healing here or do I see this getting worse? Do I see a solution here or do I just see the problem increasing? See, where, where does that come from, you know, that solution? Well, it comes from our thoughts, from our feelings, from our convictions, from our dominant belief. So we have to change the image you hold of yourself if you are holding an image that is not good. Look. The way I always say it is God looks at you and says, I like them. I made them. I've got their picture on the fridge, right? That's how God feels about you. So if God feels that way about you, why wouldn't you get on board with that? You know, we have to hold, change the image we hold of, of, of the outcome, you know? And, and so what I mean by this is that we have to stop limiting God. Our limited thinking, our negativity, our disbelief is what limits an infinite power. Um, so there was a man who entered his mule in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. And his, uh, his friends inquired whether he thought the animal really had a chance to win the race. And the man replied, well, no, no, but I feel the association will do him good. Right? <laughs> so I would ask us today to think about are our associations, our mental associations, doing us any good, right? I'm, I'm not even going to go down the road about, well, never mind. Okay. So uh, are our associations, our mental associations, are they doing us any good? It's, it's important enough for you, if it, I think it's important enough for all of us to give our attention several times a day, you know, to the highest and best that is within us, right? In Matthew, it says, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So if at the end of the day, you had a bucket on one side of your bed and a bucket on the other side of the bed, and you put all the good words, all the life-affirming positive words you said during the day in one bucket, and all the negative, disturbing, fearful, doubting words in the other bucket, which bucket would be more full? Now, hopefully, most of what you say, most of what you think is going in that life-affirming bucket, right? That's, that's where we want to get to. You say, well, it's just the way I know life to be. Well, I, I understand. But, you know, you get what you look for. And so if you look for things to not work out, if you look for things to be negative, if you look for people to disappoint you, they absolutely will. Isn't that incredible? How that works? You say, hey, if, if that way doesn't serve us, we might want to develop faith in something else. Mm -hmm. right? So as long as we're thinking we might as well create for the good, right? we all have the capacity to think. Why not think in a way that's going to make our life be better? Right? So, so several things occur to me. First, we have to give up feeling sorry for ourselves. Right? It is counterproductive. 
it will not get us to a greater expression of life. You cannot feel bad about yourself so much that things turn around for you, right? It will not get us what we want. So just give that up. Just give that up. You know, it says in the Bible, it says, and it came to pass. So if you're having a bummer right now, just know that it came to pass. It does not say it came to stay. It says it came to pass, right? So we must cease all self-criticism, condemnation. That's got to go. It's got to go. Nothing good happens from that. Nobody gets criticized. Uh, nobody self-criticizes into being better. It just makes you feel awful, and before you know it, you're on the sofa, and you're surrounded by empty Pepperidge Farm containers. How does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> See, because being, being hard on yourself never encouraged anyone to grow. It didn't. It just, being hard on yourself just made you feel worse about yourself. And I think we have to con just stop with the condemnation and criticism of others. Say to yourself, you know what? I bless you and I release you to your highest good. I bless you and I release you to your highest good. I bless you and I release you to your highest good. And if somebody gets in your face and you really feel like they are not for your highest good, then you just have to silently say, your good is elsewhere. Go to it quickly. <laughs> yes. Your good is elsewhere. Go to it quickly. I think that's a very direct kind of prayer. See, because the negativity in our consciousness prevents the healing of any discordant situation. Do we see that? That stuff that we hold on to, the negativity, the condemnation, the criticism, all of that kind of stuff is what prevents healing from happening. You know, this is metaphysics. And metaphysics means we are interested in what's beyond this physical plane. What else is there other than what our eyes and our five senses take in? Right? There's more to us. So we're not here to hope. We know. We know a higher truth. So every time we pray, every time we affirm, every time we visualize, we're reinforcing the ideas of wholeness, of perfection, that are already seeds planted within us. Now, I know they say nothing is forever, and, and, and we will overcome the conditions that we have in our lives with our knowledge and, uh, of how mental and spiritual laws operate. So if we turn away from the problem, right, and contemplate the healing power of God that is everywhere but also within us. Right? The healing power is within us, and we hold on to that. We can start to sense and see the things that things in our life are actually improving, and we get back on track. You know, I say that all the time that God gives to us in the realm of mind. So an idea comes in, a thought comes in, because God gives to us in a very abstract kind of way. And we have to be open and receptive to life and then do something about it. See, I want to participate fully in every aspect of my life. I want to live a really wide life, you know? The people have told me, well, you expect a lot from God. And I tell them that's because I have a really big God. Yeah, I do. I expect a lot because I have a really, really big God. Now, my part in that equation is I have to keep expanding my consciousness so I give room for a really big God to express in a greater way. You know, I was speaking um, with a chronologically gifted couple recently. Uh, I have known them for many, many years, and they, they always inspire me. And I, asked, I was asking them, you know, well, what are, what are you up to? You know, you've always got something going on. And they said that they were they very laughing, uh, joyfully, they said, we are spending our kids' inheritance. And we are... Uh, <laughs> And I said, oh, really? And they said, yes, we're, we're going on this great grand trip to Alaska. And I thought, oh, great. I think that's wonderful. I really do. I think that's absolutely spectacular. See, I don't want to approach my life uh, with any sense of I'm not much or I'm helpless or I'm a victim or I'm not creative enough to create what I want. You know, I, I don't want my past to dictate my future. I have to have a commitment to use my mind on behalf of my own greater good. And people will say, and, and, and they always do it in this whiny, whiny tone, well, maybe God doesn't want me to stop right there. That is nonsense. That is absolutely nonsense. God doesn't want for anything. And if he did, he would want you to get it together and stop whining, okay? <laughs> Honest to God. So, so a man goes to a doctor and the doctor tells him that he has an incurable disease and he's going to die. And he says, well, what am I going to do, doctor? And the doctor says, well, you must give up smoking and drinking, red meat, oh, no fried foods, and forget about sex and no sugar. And the man says, wow, that's a lot. Will that help me live longer? And the doctor said, no, but it will seem a lot longer. Okay? 
Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> My point is that no one came here to lose or be defined by a problem, right? In God, everybody can win. The infinite intelligence that we are working with is limitless. Let's accept it. Let's use it. So pray with me now as we turn our attention inward. <laughs> All right, so we come together in thought and consciousness, remembering that right here we are surrounded and filled with an infinite loving presence that we know is God, its spirit, its life, its truth, its love itself. And it is the most real thing about each and every one of us, that we are one with God and we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And so I speak the word for us that whatever is out, whatever is not right in our life, I know that with God, all things are possible. I accept this is true for every person here. And so we open our minds and we open our hearts and we know that that presence and power of God's love, of God's intelligence, of God's healing is greater than anything we experience. We know this for ourselves. We know this for those we hold near and dear today. So we include in our prayer our family members and friends, parents and children, all of our loved ones. And we remember that God is right where they are as perfect support, as all needs met, as healing, as right outcome. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world, so all of those things that pull at our attention, we withdraw all of our condemnation, all of our criticism, and we affirm that God's perfect activity is unfolding in and through all of it. We let our prayer be a blessing not only in the life of our church, but all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today that everyone gets raised up, that there is healing for each and every one of us willing to accept it, and I know we accept it. So with a full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.